everybody could settle down and take your seats. Uh, welcome to the Economic Policy Institute. I am Thea Lee, president of EPI, and I am thrilled to introduce today's panel discussion on Women in Economics, the Washington edition. Uh, last, week, last week in New York City, EPI showcased all six of our amazing women economists and their research at the Ford Foundation, which is a longtime EPI Foundation supporter. And today, we have a really amazing panel for you. It is a multi-generational group of women economists and aspiring women economists uh, to talk about both uh, their work as economists, their, their experience in the field, but also the field itself and what, what it has been and what it um, could be to be more welcoming and nurturing for women and people of color. For myself, as a woman of a certain age, as a, daughter, as a daughter of immigrants from two continents, from Asia and Europe, uh, I made my way to econ grad school at the University of Michigan in the 1980s, and I made a career as a trade economist in Washington, DC. I put up with a lot of crap along the way <laughs> and scrambled over a lot of obstacles. Uh, sometimes I was the only woman in the room or on a panel or speaking out. But I think you know, here at EPI, we are certainly committed to making sure that the next generation of women economists has fewer obstacles to scramble over and more support at every step along the way. And at EPI, we are committed, of course, to hiring and nurturing a diverse and a talented staff. But really, our goal is much, much more than that. It is ensuring that our work, our research agenda, our outreach, and the partners that we choose are transforming the way we see the economic challenges and injustices that we see around us. And at this particular moment in history, this seems more important than ever. So thank you all for being with us. Thanks to those of you who are watching on live stream. And without further ado, I will hand over the panel to our wonderful and talented moderator, Heather Long of the Washington Post. Thank you so much. A uh, huge thanks to Thea Lee, president of the Economic Policy uh, Institute, and to EPI for hosting this event, and to all of you for being here. Uh, this is a huge moment in the field of economics, and there's a lot of uh, positive momentum, I think, to try to make change and increase diversity. And what we want to do, and Thea set the, uh, the tone, we want to get real for the next hour. We want to talk about some of the problems that still exist and the doubters who still don't think we need to make change, but we also want to have this be a, almost like an exercise class where you leave, you know, with a little bit of an adrenaline rush. You leave with some ideas and some enthusiasm for things that you can go back to your organization or that you can join, initiatives that you can join to try to make positive change so that um, in 20 years we don't have the same number of female and uh, minority economists that we do today in the United States and around the world, which is not enough in uh, my opinion. So we have a great panel to try to unpack all of this today. Sitting right next to me is Kayla Jones. She graduated in 2018 with her bachelor's degree in economics and is already shooting to the top as a scholar at Harvard University. And perhaps even more impressive, you are part of this change. She was one of the people who founded the Sadie Collective, which is working to increase specifically African-American female economists in the profession. We're looking forward to hearing more about the latest on what's going on with the Sadie Collective. Uh, next to her is Professor Nina Banks, who is Associate Professor of Economics at Bucknell University in my home state of Pennsylvania. She's also on the board here at EPI, and she seems to like to wear a lot of hats. <laughs> she is also affiliated with the Women's Studies Department and Gender Studies Department at Bucknell, and she helped to co-found the Africana Studies Department at Bucknell. Uh, next to her, it feels like Janet Yellen needs no introduction, <laughs> but she's currently a Brookings Fellow. We all used to see her as chair of the Federal Reserve and as head of the Council of Economic Advisors before that, and is also the, going to be president next year of the American Economic Association, which is very much at the forefront of trying to change this profession of economics and these issues. 
So before we kick it off with our panel, we thought we'd just get a sense of where the audience is at. So what we know in economics is about a third of PhD students at the moment are female in economics. Uh, let's pick a year like 2030. Raise your hand if you think by 2030 we can have 40% of economic PhD students as female. Can we go from a third to 40%? All right, so that's some enthusiasm. Keep your hand up if you think we can get close to 50% by 2030. Can we really move the dial? Okay, so we have some pretty good enthusiasm here. <laughs> Just, <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So to kick it off for our panel, um, if you had to give a short elevator pitch about why economics needs to be more diverse, sort of one of those 30 seconds to a minute, convince the skeptics, why don't we go down the row, sort of what would you say to the people who aren't in this room and are still on the fence? So I would say the key advantage of having more diversity in economics would be not only would it lead to a better science, but it also will lead to a better pedagogy as well as to the creation of better policy dimensions. So we think about the current status quo of economics. Most economists are white men, of course, and that can be dangerous because it can lead to groupthink. And also it can cause a profession to miss crucial information and leading to incomplete policy solutions. And overall US economic policy would be increased and be more efficient if we had those from different backgrounds and different perspectives being able to be a part of that process. So Heather asked us to get very real and I'm gonna be very real here. I don't use the framework of diversity when I talk about inclusion, especially the inclusion of populations who have historically been excluded based on race and ethnicity in the United States. And here I'm talking about African Americans, um, Puerto Ricans, Chicanos, and native populations. There's this wonderful quote by Angela Davis which and I'm going to paraphrase it, um, but she says that when people link diversity to equality um, and justice, that's okay. But she said there's a model of diversity as the difference that makes no difference and the change that brings about no change. And I think that unfortunately, that is really the model of diversity that has taken hold in higher education in the United States. So when I talk about diversity, um, I talk about diversity of thought, but when I talk about inclusion, I talk about it in terms of those populations that have been excluded historically. And that's a matter of justice, not a matter of diversity. Diversity in thought is uh, lacking in economics with respect to the dominance of the mainstream approach rather than heterodox approaches, which are often marginalized. Um, so I would say it's important to focus on diversity, first of all, because the lack of diversity in the economics profession, to my mind, points to a problem with the culture in the field and the way it works. Um, the American Economic Association recently conducted a survey that showed that women and minorities feel less valued and less included socially um, in the profession. They feel their talents aren't fully realized. Um, women and minorities have suffered uh, harassment and discrimination throughout their careers. And um, to avoid that, a large share of women uh, report altering their behaviors in ways that are counterproductive to career progress. And the climate overall that promotes um, underrepresentation, in my view, of women and minorities is something that serves to diminish job satisfaction of those who are in the profession and is unfair in that sense. Um, as Kayla mentioned, and I would agree, I think the lack of diversity also skews the field's viewpoint and diminishes its breadth. Um, women work in every field of economics, but they particularly tend to focus on um, fields that um, are important to people in their lives, health, education, development, labor, 
um, discrimination, income inequality, and um, I, I believe that the underrepresentation of women and minorities skews the work that's um, done in the field. Uh, women and men tend to bring different approaches to the same problems. Um, there was a recent survey that found that women and men have systematically different views on uh, a range of questions, for example, relating to health insurance um, and the minimum wage. And they see the world differently. Women are much uh, more likely, when asked, to say that labor opportunities, labor market opportunities for men and women are not equal, and they're more concerned about inequality. Um, so I think that the prevailing views are probably biased by um, the relative lack of women and minorities. And finally, I'd say that in policy-making contexts or decision-making contexts where people work together in groups to make decisions, that um, having diversity is very important to actually ending up with better solutions um, and better outcomes. There's a good deal of research that shows that diverse groups outperform in solving complex problems and that ethnic diversity promotes better deliberation and disrupts um, a tendency to conformity in thinking. Um, so let me stop with that. With that. <clears throat> Um, well, first of all, we just want to encourage people to uh, to tweet a bit some of these ideas to try to get the conversation going even beyond this room. Uh, we were talking about hashtags earlier, and we thought uh, hashtag women in econ is, a, is um, starting to be a bit of a trending one. And of course, econ Twitter always has a lot of people uh, discussing. So why don't we go back down the row and... Be really blunt. Have you, do you feel you've experienced discrimination in your economics career so far? And maybe you could say briefly about the, uh, the, the gender and racial ethic di diversity or lack thereof in the department where you studied economics. Uh, Janet referred to that American Economic Association climate survey that was done earlier this year. And in that, uh, I believe, 30% of women and 25% of non-white economists said that they have experienced discrimination in the field of economics. I think that number, those numbers really woke people up in addition to some of the more stark comments. One of the ones that's been getting a lot of attention is an African-American woman who said, I would not recommend that my own child go into this field because of all the discrimination and bias that she felt had um, she had experienced in her career. Career. Let's get, maybe get a sense. Kayla? Um, so un unfortunately, I have experienced some uh, discrimination so far. So once during my senior year of college, I went to uh, visit for a meet and greet at a university um, that I was interested in applying to, and I met with some of their senior economic faculty members. And from my first interaction with some of these professors, they assumed, without even asking me, that I lacked the relevant background to um, be eligible for to be eligible to apply to that program. And um, they also made blatant comments about whether or not outside the program would I be even would I be able to fit into the city that the program was located in. So, needless to say, I won't be applying to that school. <laughs> um, but luckily for me, from my past participation with the AEA summer program, I have great mentors there who have a sense of what programs are out there that prioritize diversity and inclusion and have a track record of graduating minority students. So I'm glad to have them to serve as a guide for me moving forward to help mitigate uh, incidences like that. Uh, so I studied economics um, in the 1990s in a, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is a heterodox program. And in those days, um, I think it was fairly diverse, although we didn't appreciate the amount of diversity at the time. There were two women in my class. Of, it was a small class of about 12 students. And I think that there were, there were two black women, African-American women in the entire program. About a third of the faculty were women. And I think that that was, and they were, 
phenomenal. The entire <laughs> faculty were phenomenal. Um, but I think that made a difference. Um, in terms of graduate school, I didn't really feel a sense of bias except on occasion thinking that male students had an advantage because after class they could hang out with the professors and, and become close with the male professors. Um, but I never felt comfortable doing that. So that was really the only um, gender issue that I, that I thought about as a graduate student. Um, since getting the doctorate degree, I have experienced discrimination um, a few times, not often, I have to say. Unfortunately, I experienced sexual harassment very early on in my um, program. I went to graduate school to study development e economics. I wanted to become a development economist. And after my first year, I went to Washington, D.C., and I worked for um, an organization, a government organization in the Washington, D.C. area. And my supervisor was an economist, and he spent, he was 20 years older, married, and he spent the summer harassing me. And I'm not very comfortable talking about it, um, but I, I will just say that I ended up not becoming a development economist as a result of that experience, really because I assumed that if he could get away with it um, in DC, in the DC area, working for a government agency, that there were probably a lot of men like him in the field. Um, and so I ended up not pursuing development economics, which was really my love. Um, recently, I've been experiencing a different type of, I wouldn't call it discrimination. I think it's more of a um, bias that exists towards black economists in general, not just black women. And this is a bias where our research is not cited or our research is attributed to someone else. Um, and I can think of a number of examples of that. There's a conversation taking place nationally about black women in economics, um, but there's something, I think, uh, there's a missing variable there. And the missing variable in that conversation is black women who are actually economists. Um, black women who've gone through graduate programs, have masters and doctorate degrees, and who've worked as economists. And so I think that that conversation would benefit from having an engagement with black women who are at the senior level. Some have retired and some are um, about to retire. retire. Julianne Malvo, Cecilia Conrad, Margaret Sims. Um, that conversation about black women in economics was really, I think, initiated by the presidential address of Rhonda Sharp in 2018 before the National Economic Association. And again, rarely do we see Rhonda cited um, during the context of the conversation on black women in economics. Um, and for my own part, I've been spending many years researching, I call it excavating the um, economic thinking of Sadie Alexander. And there are conversations taking place about Sadie Alexander that discuss my work, but almost never cite any of my research findings. And so, so that's a common problem that I think that black economists have and that I'm experiencing right now. Can you just say briefly uh, who Sadie Alexander is for anyone who might? Uh, well, no. when I started researching Sadie Alexander a long time ago, around 2003, most economists thought that the first black economist in the United States was George Edmund, Edmund Haynes, one of the things that I found a few years ago when I was digging through her archival records, um, some records going back to the 1940s, is that um, George Edmund Haynes was probably not the first black economist, and so I continued to do research on that question, and I found that, in fact, Sadie Alexander was the first African-American economist. Um, so uh, she's the first African-American economist. She got her degree in 1921 from Penn, um, but Women's colleges in the country were the places where women, white women who had doctorate degrees went to work, um, but they were racially discriminatory towards black women. They didn't admit black students, and they weren't going to hire a black woman. So she did not have a career as a practicing um, economist. She ended up becoming a lawyer instead. But her legacy has really been lost to the profession. Julianne Malveau has written a, a seminal article on Sadie Alexander and the loss to the profession, but I've been really trying to excava excavate um, her life and restore her to the canon of economic thought.
that's who she was. She was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I studied at Yale between 1967 and 71. Um, there were not a lot of women, but there were three of us in a class of about 25 students. Um, there, were, there was no racial or ethnic diversity. Um, I noticed on the faculty at the time, there was not a single woman tenure track faculty. There was one woman who was very well thought of, but she uh, had a position as a lecturer. And that struck me as unfair, and I also noticed at the time there were several faculty couples where both husband and wife were economists, and the women were not allowed to have faculty positions. Um, they, some of them continued to do research, but um, were never really able to have um, normal academic careers. So um, that concerned me in terms of the position of women in the field. That said, um, I had, I never felt any sense of discrimination whatsoever during the, my student days at Yale. Um, I had mentors who were um, famous um, economists. My interests were very mainstream in macroeconomics and international, which was um, Yale's main strength at the time, and um, faculty really supported me. I had wonderful mentors and re received a lot of uh, support in the job market. So in that sense, I have no complaints whatsoever. Um, my first job was as an assistant professor at Harvard, though, in 1971, and that was a completely different story. Um, when I went there, I was the only woman on the faculty, and I found it a very lonely and discouraging life. I guess I um, felt it was an extremely, as you can imagine, very competitive sink or swim environment. It was very much a publish or perish situation. Um, I understood that almost all assistant professors perish, and I expected to be one of those. And um, I was really completely on my own um, in terms of doing research, and I had virtually no one to talk to or to work with, which was not a um, very an atmosphere that I would say is very conducive to success. I, I wouldn't say it's discriminatory, but it certainly was a situation that wasn't conducive to success. Uh, I think if anyone had asked me at the time did I think I had a fair shot, I would have said, yeah, everybody's on their own, and um, you know, I, I have as good a shot as anybody, and if I don't get it, it's, it's completely um, my fault. But after I was there for about three years, another woman was hired on the faculty. And lo and behold, what happened was that we immediately became close friends, started talking about, um, saw one another socially and started talking about work, started working together. Over the next few years, we wrote seven or eight joint papers. And um, both of us ended up getting tenure, not at Harvard, but at other places. And I guess when I look back on it, um, you know, it seems to me that this was a pattern, that um, what I recognized is that being in a tiny minority and not having a network and not having people that you can hang out with um, and form research collaborations with, that often research collaborations are very important to success. Uh, in economics, and um, those collaborations don't form just because two people happen to share common intellectual interests and decide we'll get together. It comes out of a social network, going out um, for drinks after a seminar, meeting socially, talking about work and beginning to work together. And I think that was a serious disadvantage and is for um, people who find themselves in um, minority situation. So in, in terms of have I experienced discrimination, I don't think I would exactly call that discrimination, but I would say that um, in many ways the, the culture and the environment is not conducive to the success of women and minorities when they find themselves in small numbers. 
It's really hard to hear these stories, and particularly from you, Kayla, that it's still going on. You know, I think too often we think this is a problem of a bygone era, and it's not, given what you're sharing with us today. Um, you know, we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., in a place stone's throw from the Capitol and the Federal Reserve and the White House. And you know, I was wondering, maybe we'll reverse and come the other way on the panel this time, but how different is it in the policy world versus academia? Is there is there any sense that it's a, a little bit easier to navigate some of these challenges in, in one world versus another? I know, Nina, you were sharing that you know, just harrowing story of what happened when you came to the policy world and tried to get in development economics. But uh, maybe you two could weigh in a little bit on some of those similarities and differences. Do you want me to start off, or do you want you want to you well, want to begin? I don't really think I know the pol I don't really think I know the policy world much in D.C. anymore. I mean, I can. The I think one of the big issues in the academic world is that the 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 work is nonstop that it's all day and pretty much every day. Um, but I don't think I've had enough experience in the policy world to really be able to differentiate the two. So, uh, Heather, I think, you know, my sense is um, I, I'd be hesitant to generalize about DC. Um, there are different pieces of it and they operate, they operate differently. So I've spent many years at the Federal Reserve and um, one of the things we found, actually, Brookings recently did a survey of um, economists in the federal government. There's better representation of women and minorities in the federal government. And one of the things that the American Economic uh, Association survey showed is that there's a higher sense of satisfaction and less feeling of marginalization and discrimination um, among uh, women and minorities who work in the federal government, although it still exists, it's less pronounced uh, than in academia. And I think the contrast I see is that academia is an environment where um, it, you're, you're, ex you're expected to be entrepreneurial, to go off for five or six years or whatever you have as, a, as an assistant professor to write a lot of papers, to become famous, to figure out how to do that. And it's very much publish or perish and you're evaluated at the end of say six years and it's either up or out, you get tenure or you're gone. And in the meantime, at least in my, my day, and I think it's still true, you don't have annual evaluations. When you're evaluated, it's almost all research oriented. To some extent, teaching at least, being able to succeed as a teacher is probably a constraint. There's, people don't evaluate you on how do you interact with others unless there's something utterly egregious, your role in mentoring students or how you interact with students and faculty, um, whether you're attentive to diversity and inclusion. Um, these are things that aren't discussed. Um, you know, let, let's say economics is famous, for example, especially academia for a seminar culture that is very aggressive and hostile. Um, certainly there are seminars where um, you would be lucky to get through your very first slide without interruption in which you um, explain what you're going to do. And it's not uncommon uh, for somebody to interrupt in slide number one and to say, you know, I just have to tell you that you've asked the wrong question and you're looking at it the wrong way. And, you know, you, you, you've not even succeeded in laying, laying out what you're going to do. And, you know, often there are extremely aggressive, typically men who are, you know, responsible for that culture. And also individuals who um, don't behave that way and see that that creates a culture that is hostile and makes it difficult for anybody, but particularly men, women and minorities, to succeed and to feel valued. And they won't say anything. They, they realize it's not the way it should be, but they don't say anything. And um, it, it just, people, people don't interfere with other people. Um, 
and tell them, you know, your behavior in these seminars, the way you're treating people, it's creating a hostile culture. It's a culture in which academia, in which that wouldn't be done. And it's, it's in department chairs, well, they run departments, um, they're members of departments, and these are things they tend, um, unless something rises to really being a very serious problem not to attend to. So let me now contrast that with what I saw at the Federal Reserve. Um, which I would regard as a, um, a workplace that takes diversity and inclusion much more seriously and is much more systematically attentive to thinking hard about how to create an environment that um, will promote diversity and inclusion and will be supportive. There, um, it, It's an environment which there are um, human human resources professionals and who are thinking much more systematically and regularly about um, the environment, surveying it in the same way the AEA does, taking climate surveys. Um, there are annual reviews and um, the feedback on performance at the Fed. Yes, um, it w reviews economic research and um, the quality of policy analysis, but also um, looks at uh, interactions with colleagues, ability to communicate, how well do people work with and mentor others uh, that they work with. Um, it, there are groups that meet routinely to um, think about whether or not there are practices or a culture that's impeding the progress of women and minorities. There's um, active focus on mentorship. There's succession planning and in succession planning, a focus on um, what does our pipeline look like? Is it sufficiently diverse? Um, would women and minorities be able to fill positions that could be could come available where they'd have a chance to rise? And um, if people aren't ready, there would be discussions of what do we need to do to make sure that these people have the experiences that will prepare them to um, fill those roles. Um, and conscious thought about how do we need to develop people and give them the leadership and training that they need to succeed in this organization. So, you know, to me, the, the, that difference in kind of management of groups of professionals and uh, systematic thinking about diversity inclusion, it actually makes a difference. And of course, you know, still the you know, numbers and experience, there's, there's more to be done. You know, I said, Washington, it's not all the same. Um, and, you know, you mentioned uh, policy jobs where people work all the time. Oh, let me just say another, another important aspect for women is um, work-life balance. And, you know, the Fed thinks seriously about how can we promote the careers of very promising people who have responsibilities that can't be 24-7 um, in the office. How do we make those um, success in, in that possible? You know, there are other parts of Washington. I worked in the White House. The White House is a completely different environment. It's 24-7, it's aggressive, it's competitive. There's a ton happening. Um, the culture is extremely macho, it's extremely aggressive. And um, even in administrations that have placed high, very high priority on making sure that senior <laughs> positions are um, filled with women and minorities, um, still, the culture is one that I would say is not terribly supportive of success for those groups. Well, that was pretty diplomatically said, I think. <laughs> Janet Yellen doesn't tweet, to our knowledge, but <laughs> yet, yet. But um, no, I was struck by what you, <clears throat> what you said. I mean, there's been such an abundance of studies and, and basically data and evidence coming out in the last two or three years, people sharing their personal experiences to try to enlighten 
the, the field of economics that there is a problem. And it feels like there's been an acknowledgement that there's a problem. Uh, just in the last few weeks, I guess, graduate students have been going to seminars and taking an iPad and record, sort of recording and taking notes on how the female versus male speakers or white versus non-white and whether who gets challenged on that first slide. And you know, they're, they're building an actual data and evidence to show that just what we know anecdotally is is happening across the country with women and, and people of color getting challenged on the first slide a lot more often than white men. Um, but I guess let's turn the conversation to potential solutions. What do we do about this? It feels so daunting to try to make change on, on so many of these issues. And we've talked both about, many of you have mentioned mentors and how important colleagues and mentors have been to, to your, you being an economist today or on the path to being an economist. Uh, others have talked about you know, the different types of research ideas and questions that are asked when different types of people are in a room. Uh, we've talked a little bit about hiring practices and how important structuring a hiring practice can maybe be to getting a different type of pipeline or looking at different candidates. So I'm wondering, there's so many different initiatives going on, but maybe each of you could sort of touch on two or three that you think are, are, are really momentous or maybe that we need more people need to be trying and doing. Maybe we'll start with Kayla and the Sadie Collective, among others. Uh, so yes, so in summer of 2018, uh, Anna Puku Ajiman, as well as Fonta Troye, approached me with the idea of starting a conference exclusively for young black women who are interested in economics, which was an opportunity that I was eager to help them be a part of because I'm also very passionate in making sure that this space is diverse and also inclusive. Um, so I worked with them last fall to put on our first annual conference, which we were able to host um, at Mathematica Policy Institute here in DC. Um, and we also were able to garner a lot of support on um, Econ Twitter. We were able to raise a lot of money um, through just networking with economists on there to put on our first event, which was pretty successful. We had over 100 attendees present. We had people come from over 30 plus institutions. And we're excited to put forth our second annual conference uh, this February at Urban Institute. Yeah, I, I think that there are a number of really important initiatives going on um, within the profession, and some have been going on for quite a while. The summer program, for example, um, the, um, and there's a mentoring program for people who are graduate students. There's a program, it's called DITE, um, that is for junior faculty um, from underrepresented groups to ensure their success um, through the tenure process. That's a program out of Duke University that was initiated by Sandy Darity and, and Rhonda Sharp. Um, I'm working on, a, um, I, an, a, on a, an, an AEA task force that has outreach to high school students and undergraduates, and this is a newly formed task force, so we're just getting underway. I'm on a um, subcommittee with Ann Owen, who is at Hamilton College, and so we are looking at curricular issues because um, I think our sense is that the curriculum is often off-putting to um, people from historically excluded groups in the United States. Um, another issue or, or initiative that I was involved in, that I have been involved in, is that I organized a summer conference that brought together um, economists to uh, look at issues of importance to communities of color in the United States. I brought together economists from the National Economic Association and the American Society of Hispanic Economists. Um, and so we've, it's a research conference that's held during the summer. Um, and increasingly, we've also focused our attention on the concerns of indigenous communities. So I think that's one way that, that I've been trying to increase these initiatives within the profession. Well, I'm involved with um, the American Economic Association's um, initiatives in all of these areas, and you've mentioned the mentoring and the activities of the um, committees on women in the economics profession, minorities in the economics profession that have long run mentoring programs. Um, we have a new 
um, standing committee on the status of LGBTQ uh, individuals in the profession. Um, you mentioned the task force, Nina, that you're serving on a new task force um, to attempt to um, attract more women and undergraduates um, into the field. And I see Amanda Beyer sitting here. She's um, running a task force, another new task force, I think is very important on best practices in the profession that's trying to look very concretely in different areas that we're involved in, from running conferences to conducting research, working with students, um, hiring promotion. Um, what are best practices? What are the things that work? What, what's a real um, set of suggestions for things that uh, individuals can do that will promote diversity and inclusion? And I think the, the recommendations have recently been disseminated now or on the AEA website, and I think they're well worth looking at. Um, we've hired the AEA for the first time, is hired in the, an ombudsman who is available to um, help AEA members deal with ep episodes, incidents of sexual harassment or violations of the code of professional conduct in the context of AEA activities. Um, and um, one of the things that this ombudsperson can do is um, accept reports from individuals, uh, anonymous reports of instances in which there's um, harassment experienced. And um, if the ombudsman receives multiple reports about a particular individual from a number of people, um, while being very careful to preserve privacy and anonymity, the ombudsman has the possibility, if the individuals want, of identifying them to one another. Sometimes an individual doesn't want to press charges or um, undertake actions against someone that they feel has harassed them um, if they're the only person, but when they realize that they're one of several, um, that motivates action. And so on all these fronts, the AEA is really trying to step up what it does to deal with um, harassment and discrimination. <laughs> Thank you. And we're about to open it up to the audience for your questions and feedback. And just before we do, I'd, um, we, we've, we've touched on a lot of different initiatives that are underway that are very powerful. But what I find as a reporter when I go out and ask economists about what's going on in economics and how we make change, particularly maybe people who are more male or, or white, I often get a lot of support for, yeah, we could do more mentoring or we could do more conferences. That seems low-hanging fruit. But when you really ask about should we have a quota, or you know how are you how are you going to be held accountable if still there's fewer than one percent of black uh, females in your department or in your field? Then you start getting the feathers up on some people. Then you get some well, we don't need to go that far, you know these sorts of things. So I'm curious to hear from this panel. Uh, I was struck hearing Christine Lagarde, the former head of the IMF, now incoming head of the European Central Bank, say in a 60 Minutes interview she just did that she had a rule when she was at the IMF that she instituted that she refused to attend a meeting where she was the only woman. She felt that, you know, she needed to take a stand like that. And some have suggested to the AEA that maybe they should ban the mantles, the all-male panels at their conferences, you know, just to try to really, for a couple of years or a year or two, to try to make a statement. And again, sometimes there's pushback on this notion that's, that's a step too far. And so I'm curious to hear from you all, is there a role for some of these sort of very tangible quotas, do you think, or, or would you prefer to stress other initiatives? Um, so yes, I do think having quotas would help to create a more even playing field um, in terms of creating more spaces for women and minorities to be um, invited to different panels as well as to ri rise up in different leadership positions. 
However, I do think that moving forward as future generations come along, that we need to make sure that all economists are in, are in accordance with the importance and the value of having more diversity and not necessarily creating people, not necessarily creation, creating um, quotas, but just having, making sure that everyone is aware of like why diversity is beneficial in the first place. So I don't know about the quota. When I think about a quota, I think about a cap. Um, and then in, the, in terms of panels um, or representation, I, I think it depends on the particular issue. Um, but I would look at it differently in terms of hiring practices because what I think works, what I think worked in the past was affirmative action in terms of diversifying the profession, probably from the 70s into the 90s. Affirmative action was really effective. So, um, you know, it's a really good thing that I am not a diversity officer at any college or university because I would impose a hiring freeze. Um, and the only departments that would get money are those departments that use money for um, initiatives tied to inclusion um, for people who have been historically e excluded. And you would be shocked at how many departments suddenly would start hiring more women um, and men from underrepresented groups. So, so and I, I th that's, that's affirmative action. So, well, I guess I'm not in favor of hard and fast quotas. I do think setting some sort of numerical floor um, for inclusion can be um, a practice that encourages a lot more reflection um, and attention to try to achieve, um, for example, diverse seminars and meetings. Um, so, and you know, maybe Christine Lagarde's rule that you mentioned of not participating in any, anything with as few as one is not bad, not a bad rule most of the time is a floor. There's um, an interesting article that um, appeared in the newsletter of the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economics Profession by um, Justin Wolfers and David Romer they ran um, Brookings' panel on economic activity for a number of years, and they described that when they took it on, they self-consciously decided that they really wanted to increase the level of diversity um, in Brookings' papers. And so it, certainly an informal guideline for them was no mantles. Um, and so at least one, but hopefully more than one. And they described that um, keeping track numerically and setting a floor forced them to be much more self-conscious in thinking, um, certainly when it came to discussants, um, that they were very careful not to um, ever have situations where there were only male discussants. And paper writers, um, they found they tended to think about their friends, people they knew, and that led them typically in the direction of men and being much more self-conscious about wanting to achieve diversity and trying to hold their own feet to the fire. Um, did, did improve the level of diversity. It made them think about different topics to have, about broadening the agenda of what they included in Brookings papers, because sometimes to achieve greater diversity, they realized that women and minorities worked in areas that hadn't traditionally been covered, and um, that resulted in an improvement. And so I think this um, numerical guidelines, I wouldn't want to call it hard and fast quotas, but it's not a bad idea. All right, we're excited to hear from the audience. We have some mics that are going around. If you could raise your hand and then state your name and affiliation, if that makes sense. We're going to try to take maybe two or three questions or comments and then have the audience respond or the panel respond. Uh, Theo, why don't we give it to you? Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, so Thea Lee, e EPI. So I want to push the panel a little bit in terms of you know, when do we get beyond the just like barely scraping by and not having, you know, all male panels? And how do we get to the next level where we have both a critical mass and intellectual critical mass, but also the kind of energy and dynamism that comes from having a, a truly engaged uh, 
set of economists who are looking at a whole different set of issues. And I think we're trying to do that here at EPI. We're, uh, we brought some new people on board. We're really excited about that. But that it, it's beyond just sort of like limping along and not being terrible. But being great and being amazing and, and showing that uh, a diverse economic profession actually is going to ask and answer a whole different set of questions. So that's, that's what I'm looking forward to for the next stage. And I want, I'd love to hear all your views on that. Um, right, there we go. Hi, I'm Helen Sonnenschein, retired economist, and have gone through much of the activities or the responses that has been mentioned. I particularly want to ask about the culture that you had talked about, because I had experienced it so often. Uh, in the culture, there are a couple of issues. One that's so dominant is males interrupting females constantly. And in fact, I thought we were beyond what I read in the paper just a couple days ago, where Bob Woodward was interviewing uh, the authors of, one of, of a book on Me Too. And he continually interrupted. And of course, it was just one-on-one, -on -one, but there was an audience, and the audience contained a lot of women who suddenly started erupting with, don't interrupt her, and the interruption stopped. Uh, related to that is the question of how many women does it take to, in, whether it's at a panel or in a meeting or whatever, to change that culture just because of the presence of women. I, I think there was a study not too long ago about uh, how many women there would need to be as percentage. Uh, and another uh, one last item about culture is the uh, issue of ignoring women who might raise their hand, might have a question and so forth. And if they, if they get their question answered, then somebody comes up to them, and I've had this happen to me many times, why do you ask so many questions? <laughs> Well, those seem kind of related. Maybe we'll pause there for a second and see if, um, uh, Nina, do you want to jump in on, on this notion of how we push it to the next level in, in changing the intellectual discussion in organizations? Uh, you know, and again, it goes back to the point that I made initially where we need to embrace diversity of thought in economics and stop marginalized heterodox perspectives within, within the profession. I mean, think about the irony of the sessions last year that occurred in January in Atlanta, and there was all this buzz about gender and women, and at the same time, the one association in the profession, International Association for Feminist Economists, that is devoted to studying gender disparities um, and issues that affect women throughout society and in the profession was very much concerned about having their sessions cut by the American Economics Association. We have a lot of work to do within the profession in terms of um, embracing diversity of thought. And that is tied to, I think, in terms of your question, the outreach issues um, are essentially curricular issues at the undergraduate level and also the high school level. The economics curriculum um, is very unrealistic. It tends to not reflect how the world actually operates. It makes problematic, and that's putting it lightly, problematic assumptions about women, about um, men of color, about discrimination. Um, so we need to start there. My, uh, hi, my son, who is in 10th grade, missed 9th grade um, economics, and so I worked with him over the summer with an online program, and I was really shocked that there were so many um, really terrible statements that were made in the online course. He gave, and it was boring, that's another problem. Economics is really, really boring, um, I think, in high school and sometimes in college treatments. And so he gave it about 5% of his attention and he aced it, but had absolutely no interest in it. Right? And so we need to make it more interesting. The typical economics class consists in college of white males who tend to speak with authority on subjects, even when they know very little about those subjects. <laughs> um, and, and so I think that that is intimidating to a lot of other people. Why take an economics class in that environment where a class that doesn't reflect your lived experiences when you could take a really interesting public policy course or sociology course. So that I think is, is 
a big part of the problem. And um, the long-term solution is tied to changing the thinking and the curriculum within the profession. And, and Janet, what about in organizations outside academia? How, how can you get that going, sort of going from good to great within the organization? It's um... Um, Well, I, I think the constant focus uh, is leadership from the top on making diversity and inclusion important and explaining why it's critical to the success of the organization. And then systematic focus, um, assessment, follow-up. Um, and, you know, in a place like the Federal Reserve, I mean, to take the second question about seminars and what can you do about people interrupting, in a place like the Fed, and we've done this at Brookings too, you see that this is happening, that um, a hostile environment is being created in the culture, and um, the person running it can simply say, no, we're, th this, this is not something we can tolerate. We're not going to um, accept this kind of thing. We're going we're gonna to monitor it. And um, I, I think this wouldn't happen in a university, but it certainly can happen in a place like the Fed that um, say, no, th th this is a really poor practice, and um, we, we just won't accept it. We're going we're gonna to have a rule that the first 10 minutes, um, the person has to be allowed to speak. Um, That's great. Kayla, actually, I was just thinking um, in what they were saying about... Um, have you felt the freedom to be able to suggest different research tracks and ideas that you want to pursue, or does it still feel like, you know, sometimes people say, why you, why do that, you know, do something more traditional? Um, so for me, luckily, um, I have a great network of supporters to help me um, throughout my professional journey. So as Dr. Banks mentioned, the AEA program um, is a great source of uh, professors and just a community of uh, individuals who really care about advancing diversity in the cause and who also are very receptive to my ideas and um, just generally um, with just helping minority students navigate the econ profession. Let's get some more questions. We have uh, two up here, and then we'll head towards the back. Hi, I'm Kari Harris. I work at Merrill currently. Graduated from Morgan State University in 2018 as well. Um, one thing that I think is common among the comments is that there's this idea of regulating um, diversity and inclusion. But um, as far as long-term impacts, I think, um, is there any talk around creating value with diversity and inclusion rather than trying to regulate diversity and inclusion so that there are more long-lasting impacts of what it is everyone's trying to do? Um, hi, Erica Payne, founder of the Patriotic Millionaires. I have sort of a gossipy question for um, you, Janet, which is I remember seeing the Time Magazine cover of Larry Summers, Bob Rubin, and Alan Greenspan basically setting themselves up as the Holy Trinity um, during the time that they were in the process of making decisions that helped destroy the American financial system. Um, and, it, and it doesn't seem to have tempered Larry Summers' arrogance remotely, but be that as it may, um, you and Brooks Lee Bourne were both very assertive in your views and challenging them on um, what, you know, the, the actions that they were taking. And I can't imagine but that there had to have been gender dynamics in, in that, or if there were, I'm just curious of the inside view of how that went and how you felt. All right, it feels like we have to address that one. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I, shall I start? I'll, let me try that one. Well, I have to say, at the time, one of the things that I noticed was, as you mentioned, there were three men on the cover of Time. The Fed vice chair at the time was Alice Rivlin, who was a um, formidable and impressive person um, in her own right. And I will say, even at the time, it really bothered me that it was not a, not a foursome and um, I regarded that, frankly, as a slight to a person um, I have always held in the absolute highest regard. Um, so 
I don't think I really spoke up at the time as forcefully as I should have in retrospect about uh, what was happening. I was, um, you, you referenced Brooks Lee Bourne and the uh, um, various uh, things that were going on with respect to financial deregulation. Um, I, I think Brooks Lee was 100% absolutely correct about her concern about derivatives and um, the guys there really, really clobbered her. Um, and um, I will say I watched that. I wasn't a principal, but I watched it. And in retrospect, thinking about it, I definitely feel there was an element of what is this little woman think she's doing, um, telling us guys in the industry that um, we should be doing things different. You know, there was some substantive um, concern there, but I do do think that there was definitely an element at the time of of sexism in that. And <laughs> Kayla, do you want to answer the question about how do we get beyond? I thought it was beautifully phrased, regulating diversity. Um, and do you want to address? So I think that with diversity in economics, you know, it's one thing to. Uh, you know, just state that diversity is important and try to have diverse people as part of your organization. It's also important to make sure that those individuals feel valued in that space. And I think that moving forward in order to really advance diversity, that economists need to be more insightful about whose research that they're citing and to Dr. Bank's point about making sure that the right person is being cited for their research is very important moving forward, as well as for um, in the academic space for professors, if you do uh, notice students in your classroom who are female, who are black and brown, to make sure that you see them, that you encourage them to think about studying economics, as well as uh, uh, recommending that they take you know, the quantitatively demanding courses that's needed for an economics PhD program as well as just making sure that students have mentors available to them. Because one thing that my mentor, Dr. Cook, also says, always says is, you, you cannot be what you cannot see. It's important that uh, students of color have mentors they can see, and they know from early on you know, what economics is and what, what kind of work economists do to make sure that in the long term, we not only have just more people in these spaces, but making sure that they can contribute and actually feel as though they have a sense of value in their field. Hmm. Great, some questions at the back. Okay, sure. My name is Ben Gadgelor, I'm the Center, uh, Center for American Progress. And I had a question about terminology, it's directed to Nina. You had mentioned, you were talking about affirmative action and how that's helped out, and you said it helped out women and men of underrepresented groups. Can you explain why you said that? Oh, thank you. You've been following me on Twitter, right? So there are, one of the problems, I, and this is why I focus on issues of inclusion rather than diversity, again, because I think that um, that diversity is so broad that the people who have historically been excluded, we call them historically underrepresented, but that term also, I think, um, has been applied incorrectly to lots of different, different populations. So historically excluded is more accurate and gets to those four populations that I'm describing. But the other issue is the way that we describe the groups of people, the women, um, all of these populations of women and men who've been historically excluded, sometimes it's framed as women and minorities. And the problem with that terminology is that um, it implies that women are white, um, right? And so I try to be very careful by saying, when I'm talking about the historically excluded groups, women, because that includes all women, and then men, so I said women and men from underrepresented groups, right? Or I would say women and men of color. And I think that's a more inclusive way of talking about um, those populations rather than saying women and minorities. Thank you. 
Everybody says women and minorities, but I, I think that we need to have better language. Thank you. Powerful point. In the back, I think the microphone is there. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brakesha Sams, and I work at Pew. And I'm also a master's student in applied economics at George Washington. And my question is related to, is a PhD the only path that folks can take to make a difference in the economics community? Because I think a lot of times we focus on educational attainment, but we only think a PhD can make a difference. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on folks like me who are getting a master's who don't really want to be in academia, but also want to make a difference in the economics community. That's a great question. Maybe we should pause there. And then um, uh, Nina or Janet, you want to weigh in on that? You know, I, I'm in a world where economists have PhDs, um, but I know that there are many economists with master's degrees in the policy world. And, and in fact, um, I think that in the policy world that it's very common for people to have a master's degree as a terminal degree who are doing a lot of research. Well, I would just, just add that while there are certainly a set of jobs like uh, those in economic research at the Fed that absolutely require a PhD, that in the policy community and people working on the Hill and think tanks and in um, nonprofits, um, a master's in economics or a master's in public policy is um, very good background to make a contribution. A lot of government agencies, um, Treasury hires many people who have masters in public policy, international affairs. You could also be National Economic Council head, right? <laughs> the last few have not had PhDs. Um, maybe some more comments here. Uh, I'm not sure where the microphone is. OK. Hello. Uh, howdy, y'all. I'm Catherine Edwards. I'm a former EPIRA and now an economist at the RAND Corporation. It's very nice to be back. Thanks, EPI, for hosting this. Um, the Council of Independent Colleges released a report with NORC that looked at what were the undergraduate institutions that had the highest yield ratios in terms of taking an undergraduate major and turning them into a PhD. And they found for under rep women and men and underrepresented, I don't remember how to say it, but the right way to say it, that for getting PhD STEM women, the best institutions were historically all women's colleges. And for getting PhD uh, STEM people of color, the best institutions were historically black colleges and universities. So we talk about inclusivity and how important it is, but it does seem like exclusivity is a key part of the production process. So how do we weigh and balance that? Hi, uh, my name is Susana. Um, I dropped my um, economic studies to, from Atlanta to move to DC to organize restaurant workers. And I do love your question. Um, you were studying the masters about how to you know, do more work without seeking a PhD. And I really kind of want to respond like, you know, I'm doing a lot of like labor organizing and, and uh, like my interest would be labor economics. But my question is, I didn't think I was gonna be called on, but I'm gonna speak this into existence that I will work at EPI, whether it's in 10, 15 or 20 years. <laughs> However long, it's taken me about seven or eight years to, to work on my degree. I'm 25, and I'm still a sophomore. Um, everyone has their timeline, you know? But sometimes being working class where your parents can't afford your tuition or it's too expensive for you and you're trying to avoid student loans, what kind of support systems can women, specifically someone like me, Latina, immigrant, queer, what kind of support systems can we find during our studies? You know, there's a lot of, I, I hear a lot of the struggles and bias and harassment, discrimination for women in economic spaces. But for, the, for those of us trying to still enter those spaces, what kind of support systems can we find? Um, I'm still kind of figuring out how to go back to school while I'm organizing. But otherwise, I'm just, just in awe of, of y'all and everyone here. But what kind of support systems can, can those of us still studying or trying to go back into studying uh, find? 
Thank you so much for sharing and speaking out. I think in many ways those two questions work together in this, this concept of how do we build those support networks that seem to be in place in a lot of women's colleges and historically black colleges just to build that network. Kayla, you're the freshest on the, on the lines right now. <laughs> what advice can you give? Um, yeah, so to address your question about what kind of support systems are in place, I would definitely uh, recommend you look into applying to the American Economic Association Summer Training Program. So it's a program that I actually was a part of twice, um, and the program is being held currently now at Michigan State University. And the program, as Dr. Banks also mentioned, has been uh, very integral in being an initiative that's been very intentional about getting more minorities within the economic space. The program has been going on since the 1970s, and I don't have the exact numbers, but I, knew, I do know that a lot of the current um, African-American and other minority economists have matriculated, matriculated throughout their program. And what the goal of the program is, it helps to expose minorities to the rigor of graduate studies in economics. So when you do uh, have time to enroll in school again, I really hope that you do, and I really hope that you can uh, figure everything out. And I really do applaud you with sharing your story and being very candid and, and open and honest about uh, your struggles. And I do hope that you um, eventually go back. But if you are able to attend the AEA program, um, from that experience, you'll definitely learn more about what graduate school looks like in economics, as well as you'll be able to meet individuals who really care and who are really invested in your success. You're also able to meet a network of students alongside with you who are interested in studying economics. And the program is also designed for minorities as well. So you'll be able to meet people who look like you, who have an interest in um, economics as well. Excellent advice from, from Kayla. And if I were there, I would give you a hug. You can make this, right? You can, you'll make it. Um, and I am a proud alum of the AEA summer program. I went through it back in the late 80s. And I'm also a proud graduate of a women's college. I am a firm believer in women's colleges. Um, and I, you know, I would hope that my second son will go to an HBCU. I think that, that those environments provide um, an education that is so important because um, young people are able to learn in an environment that is supportive. It's intellectually rigorous, it's demanding, but it's also very supportive. And they don't have the type of intellectual or perhaps emotional or even physical or sexual assaults that take place at other institutions. Um, so it is, a, I'm looking at you, but somebody over here, sorry, um, asked the question. I think that those. Um, are really important, and um, I wasn't aware of that study, but I think intuitively I knew it. It had to have been the case because women's colleges empower women, um, and so when women leave women's colleges, they go to graduate programs more often, at least in the past, um, compared to women who go to um, co-ed schools. Um, uh, uh, maybe a couple more comments. Um. I'm going to stand up just so I can see you. <laughs> uh, I'm Elisa McBride. I'm with AFSCME and uh, represent public service workers around the country. And I'm curious to hear um, if the profession was more inclusive of women and men from underrepresented constituencies, uh, what would we be learning more about or hearing more about in terms of the content of economics, both in the press and um, so maybe we can hear from our moderator on this, uh, as well as in terms of academic papers. I'm a big consumer of wonderful economists from the EPI who support the work of union organizers and educators and leaders. So I'm curious what you think is missing from the substance as a result of the lack of inclusivity. Hi, I'm Eleanor Lacane, and I was one of the first women graduates of Yale and an economics major. So um, it's the first time I realized I've been in a room with so many women economists. So thank you, Thea Lee and Economic Policy Institute. I was delighted to learn about the great work the Federal Reserve is doing to cultivate women economists internally. That's awesome. And also that the AEA 
has a task force on building on best practices. So I'm wondering, obviously, if Federal Reserve is doing great work, EPI has done great work, you know, Thea and the wonderful women here in this panel. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how do we identify those best practices and bring them throughout government and academia so the next generation of women don't hit all the obstacles we've been hitting. And is there one, was there one more hand up yet? Let's get one more. You're the last one, so. Hi, my name is Jasmine Fosk. I'm an economist at the Department of Homeland Security. A little higher. <laughs> Hi, so I'm um, very excited to be here. I wanted to say thank you, first of all. Um, I read recently a response from an economist, um, George Lowry, about the having a quota for affirmative action and the unintended consequence of having a distinct perception that it creates where it's hurting um, the actual race relations that is trying to solve the problem. So I was curious how you guys would um, perceive a, I guess, a potential solution to addressing that for women specifically. And in addition, um, one other question, just curious, how would we attack the bias that exists towards economics as a field in general? Um, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have encountered this at all in your experiences, but I've noticed that there is a misunderstanding, I think, which stems from the curriculum and the introduction that people experience in school towards economics and the importance of it. Well, we have a lot of different issues to tackle there, you know, from how does the discussion change in the room and the research agenda change as we have a different perspectives? How do we make sure the next generation, 20 years from now, we aren't, or even 10, we aren't having the same discussion we're having, we have to have today, and then, um, two more at the end there on the unintended consequences of quotas. And you're right, the bias towards economics. I mean, after the Great Recession, there's a sense that a lot of, quote, smart people got us really, really wrong. And, um, and I think you're right. We feel, I, I, we get letters to the editor along those lines. Why are you even quoting so-and-so anymore? You know, because they clearly messed us up so much. So um, <laughs> maybe we'll have, go down the road, but everybody can kind of pick and choose which, which question you'd like to, to uh, attack or, or address. Uh, maybe we'll start with Janet and then go backwards. Well, on the first question of what's missing um, from research because of um, the paucity of, um, paucity of women and minorities, I, I would say work on the labor market that, say, focuses on important issues like the earnings gap, the gender earnings gap, um, discrimination and equality, um, work in the home, families, um, children, health care. I think those are, those are all topics in, in issues in development as well. Um, are examples of topics that um, would receive more attention than they do um, with greater representation of women and minorities. And I, you know, I think the, um, even within fields, the focus might be different. I saw a, um, an interesting study recently. It was about medical research and it looked at patents. And what it found was that Patents where women were the inventors um, more more often focused on female diseases, and um, patents where men were the inventors tend to, tended to focus on male diseases. And so, even within a given field, um, just the choice of questions: what's salient to you? What seems important? What attracts your attention? Even within given fields of economics, the focus would likely be different. On the issue you said of best practices and how can we figure out what they are, this task force that Amanda has headed is really trying to come up with concrete suggestions in different activities of um, what changes can we make in how we um, behave and carry out our work in different areas that um, would change the culture of the field and how we treat people and outcomes. And um, hopefully, I mean, the AEA will be holding sessions at the upcoming meetings on best practices. We would like to stimulate a conversation broadly in academia among 
Um, economics departments, I think I said earlier, economics departments typically don't focus very much on these topics. It, people go off and do their own research thing. But um, attempting to generate an environment where there's more systematic attention and there are a list of concrete practices that um, faculties can discuss of um, things they ought to be doing to, pro to promote a more inclusive environment and monitoring and assessing their performance against those benchmarks, I think can be helpful. I guess what I would add to that, maybe this, uh, a shift in some values, the value of cooperation, for example, um, I think that, um, that, that women are more likely to focus on issues of distribution of resources, um, right? So to bringing different assumptions to the table rather than the assumption of scarcity. My, if I look at my own work, and it's very different from the work that other people are doing, I look at, um, as a feminist economist, unpaid work, but because I'm African American, I focus on the community. Um, so I think that's an example. And then to the question of affirmative action, and I think it was a question about resentment. Um, I don't worry about resentment because the, the resentment is already there. So I, right, and, and the goal then is to have a critical mass. And affirmative action is always forward looking in terms of the next generation. So you get the critical mass and the ben it benefits the next generation. So I guess that's my answer. Um, so to address the question about um, the best practices for increasing diversity, so as uh, former Chair Yellen mentioned, uh, Dr. Amanda, Amanda Bayer is currently in the room, and she has a website, uh, Diversity, Diversifying Economics, which with a bunch of great advice and tidbits about how to make sure that we can move forward in promoting diversity in our respective institutions. And then to address the question earlier about the unintended consequences of enforcing quotas, um, so I do believe, I do agree with you that in some instances it can cause tension um, among some members of the profession. Um, and I do think that uh, it'll be important to have also some sort of diversity training moving forward, maybe in more formal settings um, for economists to make sure that, um, as I mentioned earlier, about not only should diversity be important just for show, but also make sure that those individuals feel valued in the field. Thank you so much. We're uh, about out of time here. So for, for final thoughts um, from, the, from the panel, you know, as I was talking to a female economist of, of my generation, I'm in my mid-30s, a bunch of them texted me this morning. I said, what should I ask? And I was really disheartened how many wrote to me and said, I'm seeing fatigue on these issues in my organization. There's been this crescendo earlier this year that we're going to address it, and now people are sort of sick of hearing it. And I thought, oh, you're going to be kidding me, you know? And, uh, and so I'm just, maybe we can end on an inspirational note, sort of what keeps you going? Going. How do you kind of, what keeps you excited to be in this field of economics and be addressing these issues? Um, and I'll just say personally, this is also an issue in economic journalism. And I would say uh, myself, uh, some of the things I've started, we just started a group um, uh, for economic journalists. If anybody's in the room who is an economic journalist, we're having our first meeting in, in two weeks. And we're very excited to support each other and get together. Another thing we do, uh, I go to the Federal Reserve press conferences, and I tweeted this summer that for the first time ever there were four females sitting in the first row as, as economic journalists asking the chair of the Federal Reserve questions. It's never happened before. So trying to show people that these milestones are happening, and my boss won't like this, but I'll say it. I mean, I personally had to write a, an, an email to my organization to stress that in our own department, uh, diversity was going backwards, not forwards in hiring. And we have three open positions. And we are, you know, many of the younger reporters were hoping um, that that would be changed, you know, and be a part of the process going forward. So, it, you know, you have to speak out on these issues. You, in a, you have to kind of make the change happen, even if it's not there in every way you can. And I would just note to those who are asking about what can you do with a master's in economics, I have a master's in economics or financial economics, so please become a journalist, even if you don't want to become a full PhD economist. But anyway, final thoughts from the panel. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, so for me, what keeps me going is my passion. I know that economics is an area that I'm really interested in learning more about, and it's an area that we can really make a difference, you know, us minorities in terms of helping to ask more informative policy questions. Um, and for any young students in the room who are interested in economics or maybe watching um, online, I just would say that even though economics can be harder sometimes, it can be very rewarding. And I just would encourage you all to just seek mentors um, and just have a good support system to help navigate this uh, profession. Let me start by saying that it's not, they are not experiencing diversity fatigue, it's diversity backlash. Um, and what keeps me going is that I love the work that I do. I, I love my job. I adore my students. I have very supportive colleagues. Um, and I think that the work that I'm doing is really important. So um, it's easy to keep going. Well, and I would certainly second that. I think economics is a fascinating subject with enormous policy relevance. Um, it's been for me and so many people I know a terrific career. It's kept me wanting to get up every morning and um, work on problems that I think have the greatest relevance to human welfare. I have not the slightest regret for going into economics and would urge others that um, it is a wonderful career that um, can really make a difference to the world. And as far as work on um, diversity goes, um, I feel excited that we're at a point where um, our efforts are beginning to take off. I know certainly the American Economics Association has become increasingly focused on this. Um, we feel a charge of energy may be coming out of the Me Too movement that I think is energizing um, a, lot of, a lot of change and a lot of desire uh, to improve um, the situation. And um, I don't feel any myself any sense of fatigue or see that in the people that I'm working with. Thank you so much to our panelists. And can Dr. Bayer stand up so people know who, um, thank you, yep, to come. And <laughs> thank you to EPI. We invite conversations after the panel ends. Thank you.